Thunder because she's going to kind of talk to you about where she was and how to where she uh, how she got to where she is now. But she's got a, a bachelor's degree from Minnesota, specifically Morris, I think, and then a master's from University of Minnesota. And then your graduate work uh, for your PhD was in Iowa. Yeah. And then you had some time out in UC Berkeley as a as a fellow out there. So you've kind of been all over, but native of Minnesota, I believe. Yeah. Yep. Good. Good. So everybody can join me in welcoming Janine. She's going to talk to us about turtles and climate change. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you so much for inviting me. This is my first time out at Stone Lab, and it's been some, I've only been at Toledo for two years, and so this has been sort of on my list to get out here, and this is a great opportunity to finally see it. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about some research that I've been doing I guess really since my time at Iowa State on turtles and climate change. So my lab does a lot of research on um, anthropogenic effects on animals and how they may or may not be able to respond to them. And so, of course, one of the major anthropogenic problems in the environment is climate change. And a lot of our work, not all of it, but a lot of it is focused on turtles. So you think about climate change, and I talk about this in my intro biology classes, and climate change isn't just global warming, right? It's not. That's why we don't call it global warming anymore, because it's kind of a misnomer. So lots and lots of things are going to happen as a result of climate change. Um, we hear about things like rising sea levels and ocean acidification, and um, more frequent and severe extreme events, heat waves and things like that. Um, obviously, less snow and ice in montane regions and polar regions. Um, and then there are obviously effects that these things have on wildlife. So really generally, things that climate change does to wildlife, it makes them move, right? So they shift ranges either toward the poles. Um, some species that live on mountains can move up in elevation. Um, things that live in the ocean or in the lakes might have to move deeper in the water so that they're getting out of the higher temperatures. And this might sound good if animals can just move to where the climate is better for them, they might be fine. Um, but this, of course, has a lot of potential impacts on other species. So if you're moving somewhere else, you're encroaching on things that are already there, right? And some species that are being forced to move may actually become invasive species in their new habitat. So we see things like this little, I'm not even sure what species this is, a little butterfly on the West Coast who's moved substantially in the last, and this, this last data was from 1999. So they've moved a lot in 30 years, just moving northward as the climate um, becomes less suitable for them in their native range and their forest northward. And then we hear a lot about things like changes in phenology or the timing of a species annual event. So birds are coming back in the spring earlier. They're getting back from migration earlier. Things that hibernate, like groundhogs and marmots, are coming out of hibernation earlier. Um, there are generally longer growing or breeding seasons. And that all maybe sounds good. They just have a longer time to be active during the year. But what this means is if, if one species' phenology is changing to match the climate and another species that they depend on is not changing as much, you end up seeing mismatches. So birds who depend on sort of a masking of caterpillars, for example, at one time to feed their babies, if the birds change their breeding behavior based on the climate but those caterpillars don't, suddenly the birds are having babies at a time of year when there aren't caterpillars. And so they don't have food to feed their babies. And that's happening to the tree swallow here. And then coming out of hibernation earlier uses up really valuable energy and can actually cause decreases in health. So animals that are hibernating and come out of hibernation early or kind of wake partially up because it's warming up and then they kind of go back to sleep, that's really, really harmful to them. So changes in phenology are pretty severe in many cases. But people don't tend to think of reptiles necessarily as being a big you know, indicator species when we talk about climate change. Um, but as ectotherms, right, the reason that these guys are basking is to warm up their bodies to the temperature that they want to be. So people like to think reptiles are cold-blooded, but really that's kind of not quite accurate. So reptiles are whatever temperature that the environment is. So if it's cold out, they'll be cold unless they can behaviorally do something to warm themselves up. So these guys are warming up in the sun to get their bodies to the temperature that help them, you know, um, develop their eggs or digest their food or be active or whatever they need to do. And so just being that dependent on external temperatures makes it pretty clear that a change in climate of even a couple degrees might have pretty severe impacts on reptiles. And there have been a lot of modeling studies on lizards that do show this. If you kind of look at the optimal temperature range for an individual and then look at what climate change is likely to do, suddenly that animal is no longer, is, is going to be experiencing temperatures that are above its optimal range. And that's going to decrease its ability to do 
any regular daily activities that it needs to do. And there have been some pretty dire warnings that there might be some drastic number of lizard species extinctions over the planet as a result of climate change. Um, I do work on lizards, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So what I'm going to tell you about um, are two different projects that we've been involved with on turtles and climate change. And so this first one is um, some of what I did for my PhD work at Iowa State University, looking at sex ratios in turtles. And then I'm going to go into the current research that's going on in my lab on health effects of harmful algal blooms on turtles um, here in Lake Erie, although we're just starting this research, so I will mostly have pictures of what we're doing, and I won't have a lot of results at this point. <laughs> okay. So again, reptiles are ectotherms, so obviously the climate has a huge um, impact on how their daily lives are going in terms of what temperature they're at. But something a lot of people don't realize about reptiles is that many of them have what's called temperature-dependent sex determination, which I'm just going to call TSD. Has anybody heard of that before? So some people have. Oh, a lot of you have. Okay, cool. So that is exactly what it sounds like. The temperature that the eggs incubate at determines what sex the babies are. So these animals do not have sex chromosomes like we do, or the vast majority of them don't. They have um, TSD, which is a completely different system. Okay, so this is what we have in terms of sex determination, right? Genetic or genotypic sex determination. So there's no relationship here at all between the temperature of the egg or of the mom when she was pregnant and the sex ratio. And we always, the standard is to write sex ratio in terms of the proportion male. So no relationship here at all. But in many species of reptiles and other things, there are fish actually that have TSD, um, the temperature that the egg incubates at controls what sex the offspring are. So there's a couple different types or patterns of TSD. So type 1A, um, which is, this is the species that I'll mostly be talking about today. High temperatures produce females and low temperatures produce males. And then we have kind of the opposite pattern, type 1B, which is found in Tuatara, which are these cool little guys that are only in New Zealand, um, where high temperatures produce males and low temperatures produce females. And then you have a couple species that have this weird other pattern that we call type 2. So our snapping turtles have this pattern. Um, and the few species of lizards who have TSD also show this pattern, where basically high or low temperatures produce one sex, or sometimes actually a mixed sex ratio, and intermediate temperatures produce the opposite sex. Okay, so all of these patterns have evolved separately. They have, you know, different outcomes depending on what the high temperature produces. But in all of these cases, this little range here, so the, the temperature range within which you get a mixed sex ratio, is really narrow, so it's usually less than two degrees Celsius. So you can imagine that if the global climate were to shift up two or three degrees, very quickly you're going to start seeing, instead of your average nest temperature being here, your average nest temperature might be here, and then you're up here producing mostly or all of one sex. And so this is a big concern for reptiles, is that we might, and we are in some cases, seeing populations that are mostly one sex. And the problem with reptiles also is that they are very long-lived in many cases. Okay, so you think of things like Galapagos tortoises that we don't even know how long they live, over 100 years. Um, Tuatara, we've only been studying them for about 80 years, and so we know that there are individuals who live to be at least 80, but we have really no idea. So they basically, they evolve too slowly to keep pace with the rapid rate of human-caused climate change. They, they don't reproduce until they're 15 or 20. They may only reproduce every three or four years. They probably don't have very many babies. So their evolutionary potential is just kind of low. So they need to do something else if they're going to keep pace with climate change and prevent their populations from being all of one sex. And so what I looked at for my PhD work was whether behavioral plasticity, so just can they change their behavior, um, whether their, their behavioral plasticity in nest site choice can compensate for climate change. So basically, can females change how they nest in order to keep pace with the warming climate and not produce all of one sex? So I'm just going to talk about two kind of projects that we did as part of this work. Um, and all of this that I'm going to talk about for this first part takes place with this species here, the western painted turtle. So this is the same species of painted turtle that we have here. It's just the western subspecies, which is the one that occurs west of this line, which is pretty much west of the Mississippi River. Um, and again, this species has type 1A sex determination, where females are produced at high temperatures. And so you can see that they have a really wide geographic range. They're found in southern Canada all the way down to some disjunct populations in southern New Mexico. So this is a huge climatic gradient that these guys live in across the U.S. 
and Canada. And so does that mean that we see different sex ratios as we go from cool climates down to warm climates, or are they doing something across their latitudinal range to somehow maintain about a 50-50 sex ratio despite you know, pretty substantially different climates in southern Canada and southern New Mexico? And if there are not differences in sex ratio across latitude, what are they doing in terms of their nest site choice that might prevent them from showing these biases in sex ratios? And so I looked at three wild populations of painted turtles across their range. So we had one in northwestern Minnesota, one on an island in the Mississippi River, and um, it's kind of on the border of Illinois and Iowa, and then one of these populations in New Mexico. And this is just to show you that these three sites do differ substantially in their summer climate. This is mean July air temperature, which we know is the time of year that determines the sex of the babies. So July is the really critical time period when you're looking at sex ratios in this species of turtle. And this, again, is just to show that the, the study sites differed substantially, too. So you have pretty much just you know, scrubby um, open habitat in New Mexico, deciduous forest in Illinois, and then kind of moving into coniferous forest in northern Minnesota. And so what we do for this research is to go out and find nesting painted turtles. Um, so sometimes it's really easy. The turtles are always, they usually nest in the evening. So you kind of go out at about this time of night from mid-May till the end of June and just wander around looking for places that turtles are nesting. And this is what you see, a female turtle kind of tilted up in the grass um, the way they nest is they use their back legs to dig a hole. I think I have a picture. Yep, there's a turtle. Here's the observer. <laughs> you guys see the turtle in this picture? This was a more obviously an artificial site. This is a garage, so they like to nest in mowed lawns. Um, but this is a little bit more of a natural nesting habitat. Can you guys pick out the turtle here? You guys have a really good search image for this. So she's kind of down here in this long grass. There we go. Okay, so they dig a hole with their back feet. You can kind of see the eggs in there. Um, they'll stick their, they'll lay an egg, stick their foot in, kind of rearrange the egg to get it to fit, and then maybe put their other foot in, do the same thing, and then they'll lay maybe 10 or 12 eggs total. And then they fill in the nest with their, with all the dirt that they kind of dug out here, pat it down, scratch vegetation and stuff back over the surface, and then they'll leave. So they never ever see the nest. They do all of this by feel with their back feet. And they, they leave and they never, they can't learn because they never know whether their nest succeeded. They have no way of assessing whether their choice was good. So you'll see the same turtle coming and nesting in the exact same place every year, if it's like a road shoulder or something, um, where they usually get dug up by raccoons. And that turtle never learns the fate of that nest, so she's never able to change her behavior to you know, find a better nesting spot that's not going to get eaten by raccoons. So that's kind of an important point that I sometimes forget to make. They can't learn because they never see what happens to their nest. So we go out, we find all these nesting turtles, which is really the only way to find the nest, because once the turtle leaves, it's impossible for a human really to find the nest. The raccoons seem really good at it, but I could never find a nest after the turtle leaves. So we have to physically find the turtle nesting. As soon as the turtle leaves, um, we go back to the nest, we excavate the eggs ourselves, count how many eggs there were. We'll take a hemispherical photograph over the nest, which we can convert to kind of binary, and then measure shade cover over the nest. We measure the depth of the nest. We measure the moisture in the nest, measure how far it is from water, and then we'll also insert a little data logger, an eye button temperature recorder in amongst the eggs, and then cover the whole thing back up. And the, the data logger records temperatures throughout the incubation period, which is about three months. And we also then cover the nest up with a little piece of hardware cloth that's staked down to keep the nest from getting predated, because some of these sites have like depredation rates that are like 98%. So if we didn't cover the nest, we would have no data. And the really nice thing about painted turtles is that they incubate for about three months. They hatch out of the nest usually in like late August or early September, but they actually hibernate in the nest over the winter. So they just hatch out of the egg and then they stay in there all winter. So we can come back in the fall after they've hatched and excavate the nest and the babies are all just in there waiting, which is really convenient. Not all, not all turtle species do that, even ones that live in the same areas. So then we have all these cups of turtles. Each cup represents one nest of baby turtles. And then we can, we know, you know where they all came from. We have all the data from their nests. And so we can determine the sex of all these turtles and then know the sex ratio produced in each nest. So this gives us a really good idea of the sex ratio that year of all of those babies, right? But that's, these guys take five to eight years maybe to reach sexual maturity. So in the adult population, that's made up of years and years of cohorts of baby turtles. 
And so we also want to know the sex ratio of all of those years combined. So what's the sex ratio in the adult population? And so for that, we do um, a mark recapture study trapping adult turtles. And so we use a bunch of different methods of trapping because different trap methods are, you know, some, some are male biased, some are female biased, and they, and they don't all work in all places. So we have basking traps, um, which work pretty much like you would expect. This is a, a frame that the turtles will bask on, like this guy. And then when they're done basking, they kind of jump off, and there's a basket under the water. We've actually substantially improved our trap design from this picture. I think I have some in, the, in a later section. Um, but there's a basket under the water, and so when the turtle drops out, out off of basking, he just falls in here and is just stuck. So these work really well um, in the spring when turtles are basking. They don't work so well later in the summer when turtles are left um, needing to bask. We use bait traps, um, so we bait them with like sardines and oil, and corn works really well. Those are actually pretty male biased because as soon as a female turtle goes in there, she serves as bait for the males, and so then we end up with a bunch of males. Um, and this is a fike net, which some of you people that do fish surveys probably know about. So these aren't baited at all. There's just a really long kind of wall of netting under the water that any turtle who's traveling in either direction who hits that will just go along the wall trying to find its way around it and eventually work its way into this long trap. So that catches anybody who's traveling through. Okay, so what did we find with all of these projects? Um, basically, we saw that nest behavior in painted turtles did substantially vary with latitude. So as we went farther south, or as um, the climate got warmer, we found that turtles nested closer to the water. The soil that they nested in was wetter. Um, the nests were actually deeper when we, when we standardized for female body size, because that actually varies with latitude as well and the turtles nested later in the season. And the really interesting difference was that shade cover differ, differed pretty substantially across latitudes. And so we found that the Illinois nests were substantially more shady than the Minnesota nests. And that makes sense, right, because Minnesota is warmer, or sorry, uh, Illinois is warmer, so you would expect that turtles in Illinois would probably want to nest in slightly shadier spots to compensate. But the interesting thing is that New Mexico nests also were not terribly shaded. They were actually um, a lot more open than we would have expected. And so we did another study comparing kind of the shade that was available to what the turtles were actually using. Um, and we, we calculated what's called a resource selection function, um, which basically means what is the probability based on what's available in the habitat, what's the probability that turtle is going to choose a specific resource? And in this case, the resource is shade cover. And so the dotted areas are all sites where we measured um, the temperature and the shade cover of a site. These aren't necessarily nests. They're, they're sites that could be nests throughout this whole area, which is a nesting area in Illinois. And what we found is that the cooler colors are the sites that have a higher probability of being selected out of all of the potential shade cover options that the turtles have. And so you can see that there are a substantial um, number of spots, especially along here. This is the Mississippi River right along here, so these are kind of cooler areas. And then kind of this little shaded spot in the middle. And so these turtles have a lot of cool areas that they have a high probability of selecting. So they have a lot of shade cover options to them and a lot of areas that there's a high probability that they're going to use. This is the New Mexico study site where there's almost, so this one, there's actually some blue areas and a lot of green areas. In New Mexico, there's no blue areas at all. There's almost no green, so there's a couple little tiny spots here and a couple up here that are the only locations that have any kind of a high probability of the turtles selecting. And I can tell you that the turtles who nested in New Mexico did nest right along here. And the reason for that is that there's a canal right along here. Um, this little stretch along here that actually doesn't have any sampling, that's a road. So um, that's, this area is actually lethally hot. So any <laughs> nests that were constructed there would just fry, so turtles don't even try. And so the turtles who do nest in New Mexico nest right along the canal, literally about this far from the water. And so what ends up happening is a lot of the, the site that we work at here is a national wildlife refuge where they move water all around all the time to like water crops in this area and maintain some other kind of habitat over there. And so the water levels are really unpredictable. And at any given time, a turtle nest could just flood with no warning. And so this is kind of an ecological trap where the turtles nest so close to the water because that's the only spot where their nests are not going to fry. Um, but those spots have a high likelihood of them being flooded. So turtles in New Mexico are not in good shape. Um, 
the shade cover that they need there is really actually very limited. So this population could be in serious trouble. Okay, so that's kind of an aside. Um, but what we found as far as offspring sex ratios is the Minnesota population, remember this is the cooler site, okay, and cooler temperatures produce males. But what we found is that in Minnesota, the sex ratios were actually female bias. And the females, again, are the warmer sex. Um, Illinois was slightly male biased. This was significantly male biased, but it was, you know, kind of a small bias. Compared to New Mexico, where it was very strongly male biased, almost 100% males. Okay, and again, remember, New Mexico is the warmer site, and males are the cooler sex. So this is kind of in the opposite direction of what you would predict. Versus in adults, where, so this is when you combine all cohorts of babies from many years, um, and what we find is that the adult sex ratio in both New Mexico and Minnesota were not significantly biased. Um, Illinois, again, was slightly male biased, but we, have, we had a huge sample size in Illinois. And so I think these two, maybe if we had had more turtles, would have ended up being a little bit biased in addition. But you can see that the, the adult sex ratios, the bias kind of evens out over time that we see in these hatchling sex ratios. So over many years, you would expect that, you know, you'd have a, an especially cool year one year or a warm year one year, and then another year would be cooler. And over time, you would end up with roughly 50-50 sex ratio in all populations. And that seems to be kind of what we're seeing. Um, and I think that the reason that we're seeing kind of this opposite pattern, again, the females in New Mexico are forced to nest in the only cool locations that they have, which is right along the streams. And those spots are so cool because they're, you know, right along the water that they actually produce the cooler sex when they even survive. And in Minnesota, this is pretty far north in Minnesota, and so the turtles there have a really short growing season. So these babies have to fully develop and hatch out of their eggs by in a pretty short period before winter sets in. And so they have to be nesting in pretty warm locations to speed up embryonic development. And as kind of a byproduct of that, they often nest in locations that are warm enough to produce a lot of females. So I think that's explaining the female bias that we saw that year in Minnesota. Okay, so what we generally saw was that turtles matched their nesting conditions to the local climate, which maintains a relatively even adult sex ratio um, across the latitude. So turtles in different populations are doing different things with their nesting behavior to match that local climate and prevent themselves from producing all of one sex. Okay, so the next question is how exactly are they doing that? Is that a genetically programmed behavior that differs from one population to another, or are turtles actually able to adjust their behavior kind of flexibly to, to compensate? If it was a really warm year, for example, do they want to nest in a cooler spot that year, and can they change their behavior quickly, or are they sort of programmed to always nest the same way regardless of environmental conditions? So for that, I did kind of a crazy um, common garden experiment on nesting behavior, um, which was a little bit, I think, overly ambitious, but it, it was kind of interesting. So I went to five different populations across the western U.S. and trapped gravid female turtles from all of these populations. And then I brought them all back to a common garden environment, which was at the university in Iowa, at Iowa State. So we have an aquatic research facility that has these really nice identical um, aquaculture ponds. And so we put each population in its own pond to prevent any interbreeding. And it's kind of hard to see, but each pond is surrounded by a drift fence, so the turtles can't travel from one pond to the next, but they had habitat all the way around the pond for nesting, and we also put up these artificial shade cover structures around the pond so that each pond would have a range of shade cover options for the turtles to choose from. You can see this one turtle is nesting beside the shade cover option there. So we brought all these turtles, um, had them in these artificial ponds, and let them basically nest however they wanted in each of their populations of ponds. And then we collected all the same data that we did for the, the wild populations on nesting behavior. Um, and so the predictions here would be that if nest site choice is a genetic trait, so if they're sort of genetically programmed to nest in a certain way, regardless of what the environmental conditions are, we would expect that when we bring all those turtles from different climates to one place, that they would basically nest the same way in Iowa that they would have nested at home. So you would expect there to be differences between populations in the common garden from each other, right? You would expect 
that in the common guard environment that the Washington turtles would maybe nest under very open conditions, the New Mexico turtles would look for shade. Um, so we would expect that all the populations would differ in their nesting behavior in the common garden. But if nest site choice is a flexible trait or a behaviorally plastic trait, we would expect that the turtles would recognize that they were in a new climate, they would adjust their nesting behavior appropriately for that climate, and therefore they would all nest the same way because they all were experiencing the same climate. So in that case, we would expect that there would be no difference among transplanted populations and how they nested. And so what we found was that the turtles basically nested under the same amount of shade cover, regardless of what population they were from. So they were choosing somewhere, I think the average was like 35 or 40% shade cover on average. And then, not surprisingly, the fact that they all nested under similar amounts of shade meant that their incubation conditions were very similar. So we measured, you know, mean and maximum incubation temperature, the range of temperatures. Um, this TSP is the temperature during what we call the thermosensitive period. So that's the period during embryonic development when sex is determined. So there was no difference in any of these. Um, the incubation conditions were basically the same for all nests. And then not surprisingly, we, that translated into sex ratios that were pretty similar across all populations. So they were all male biased that year. So what that means is, all of these turtles who were from very different climates, when they were brought to a common garden condition, they chose the same amount of shade cover, that resulted in the same incubation conditions, that turned into the same sex ratio, and so that basically meant that the turtles were doing the same thing in the common garden as the local turtles. So they were adjusting their, their shade, or their nest site choice, in, mostly in terms of shade cover, to match local conditions. So their choice of shade cover is a behaviorally tra plastic trait that may allow them to compensate for at least some changes in climate. Okay, so if they can, if there is a range of shade cover options available, they can adjust their, their nest site choice in terms of shade cover to match whatever the prevailing conditions might be. So obviously in, in somewhere like New Mexico, where there just isn't shade available, they can't express this plasticity. So they're kind of stuck. If there was enough shade, they might be able to, you know, choose more shade to nest under, but they need to have that option available to them. Okay, so from this, we think, people always ask, so are turtles going to survive climate change? It seems like they have some potential that they can compensate for climate change, up to a point. If climate, you know, warms five or six degrees, that's probably going to be more than they can handle. And there have to be um, accessible shade options available to them to express this plasticity. But it seems like generally they have some potential to compensate. Okay, so I'm going to move on to current research that we're doing. Um, and again, this is a, an ongoing project, so kind of like all of you RU students who are, have some data but maybe haven't looked at the results yet, this is kind of where we are. So we're working on this, we don't have a lot of numbers to show you yet. So you guys are all familiar with the algal bloom situation that we had in Lake Erie, especially around Toledo. So I got to Toledo about a year after this water crisis in 2014, um, but we are very concerned in Toledo about how to prevent algal blooms, how to forecast what they're going to do and where they're going to be, and how to minimize impacts on humans. Um, we know that climate change is likely to severely increase climate uh, algal blooms, both in terms of their frequency and the severity when they occur. Um, we know that the conditions that favor cyanobacteria um, are the things that are going to happen with climate change. So at high temperatures, which is what we're going to see with climate change, cyanobacteria tend to outcompete diatoms and green algae. Um, warming is likely to reduce some of the vertical stratification that we would otherwise see, which means that there's a longer growing season for these toxin-forming algae. And basically, these longer, warmer summers are going to favor the growth of the algae that produce microcystins, um, which is what we see here. And we know that harmful algal blooms are liver toxins to humans. So if you ingest any of this green water, um, it can kill you or your pets. There are some concerns that eating fish that have been exposed to harmful algal blooms um, could also be harmful to humans. The toxin mostly concentrates in the organs, which are not usually eaten, but there is some small amount that's in the flesh of the fish, and so there's some concern that maybe we need to limit how much fish you eat that have been possibly exposed to harmful algal blooms. And we now know also that microcystin can be aerosolized. So in boat wakes, um, when there's tiny bubbles being thrown up in the air, that can have aerosolized microcystin. 
and that can be actually more toxic if you inhale it than if you ingest it. So this is another kind of severe concern. But we really know very little about how, how harmful algal blooms affect wildlife. Um, it's probably not a good thing. Most Vertebrates have pretty similar immune systems to humans, and so when we start seeing dead fish washed up on the beach, that kind of um, you know, does not bode well for other vertebrates. And so my lab is interested in what some of the physiological effects are on aquatic vertebrates that are not fish. So we're looking mostly at turtles right now, but we're going to expand to a couple other species, hopefully in the next year or so. And so specifically, we're interested in looking at um, physiological stress levels in turtles that are um, exposed to harmful algal blooms, and also what it does to their immune functioning. And a lot of this research actually has been conducted by my grad student, Jessica Garcia, and a couple of my RU students. So this is Elizabeth Sanchez from last summer, and Austin, who's doing um, some work this year. So we are, at the moment, focused on Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, um, shown here. We've got a bunch of sampling spots the blue spots are what we call unexposed areas, so these are all wetlands that are isolated from Lake Erie, and they're kind of, they don't exchange water, so any animals in there probably would never be exposed to microcystin. And then we have this earthen dike along here where there are some water control structures which do exchange water with Lake Erie. And so these are our, what we call exposed sites. So any algal bloom that would occur in this part of Lake Erie is likely to also funnel some microcystin through that water control structure into these wetlands and any turtles in the wetlands or other aquatic wildlife are likely to be exposed to at least some levels of microcystin. And so we're doing a bunch of trapping. We've got two years now of spring, so non-algal bloom season trapping. Um, again, we're using basking traps. You can see our much better designs now. And bait traps and spike nets. And we're using a two by two factorial design for our sampling. So we're sampling during the spring, which we've done, again, two seasons of. And then we're going to do two sampling periods in the late summer, so when an algal bloom is likely to happen. And then we're also sampling in unexposed wetlands, which are these blue stars, and exposed wetlands, which are the red stars. And obviously what we're expecting is that turtles who are in exposed wetlands and during the time of year when there's an algal bloom will probably have effects of that algal bloom on them that we would not see either in spring turtles or in turtles sampled during either time of year in unexposed wetlands. So the species that we're really focusing on are the, the most common species in the area. So the painted turtle, this is um, the midland subspecies now is what we're focusing on here. And the common map turtle, which is more of a river species. So these are much bigger and they live in faster flowing water. And from this current year, we've gotten some kind of other cool species. We have a few snapping turtles that we've sampled. We've actually caught a couple Blanding's turtles, which is a state endangered species and probably soon to be a federally endangered species. And we actually caught this guy, who should not be here. Um, so this is a small male. I don't know if there are females, so I don't know if they're reproducing, if we actually have a population going. Um, but regardless, we have caught, this is at least 200 miles out of his range and possibly farther than that. These should be down in like the southeast. So probably a release pet. They get huge, so at some point, you know, you don't want them in your aquarium anymore. Um, and our plans in the next couple months are, you know, during the likely algal bloom coming up in the next couple months, we're planning to also expand our sampling to a few other reptiles. So we'll be sampling the northern water snake. To be very clear, it's the northern subspecies. Um, and also a few frog species, so the, the really common green frogs and bullfrogs, to see if we see the same pattern of what we would expect, depressed um, immune function and increased stress levels across multiple aquatic vertebrates. Okay, so what are we actually doing? So a lot of studies measure physiological stress by measuring um, corticosterone, which really works very well for most species, but our, our trapping method, I can go back here, so we check these traps about once a day. So a turtle that's caught in these traps could have been there for an hour or he could have been in there for 23 hours. And Corticosterone is the fight, or, the fight or flight response, right, the hormone that kicks in when you're really freaked out, and it acts immediately. And so if you're in a trap for 24 hours, you're going to have a different corticosterone response than if you were just in that trap for an hour. And so we, can, and we can't control for that. We have no idea how long turtles have been in these traps. So rather than measuring court levels, um, we're measuring these two types of white blood cells. So these are heterophils and lymphocytes. 
And this has, these are, have been shown, this ratio has been shown to have a really strong correlation with court levels. But they take a couple days to increase. So if you have, if you're kind of exposed to a prolonged stress event, your H to L ratio will increase, but at a kind of slow rate. And so this works a lot better for our trapping methods. So what we do is we make a blood smear. We take a blood sample from the turtle, put it on a slide, um, smear it. And then back in the lab, we stain it and look at it under a microscope. And what you see is there are five different types of white blood cells. And we're, we count all of them. But what we're interested in are these two. So I think, and I'm, I, can't, I can't do this. My students all are the ones who are really good at being able to distinguish these. So this is a heterophil, um, this little dark one is a lymphocyte. And so we count 100, of, 100 white blood cells, we tally what type of the five each of them are, and then we look at this particular ratio. And higher HDL ratios indicates higher baseline stress levels. And so this is from Jessica's project last year, just looking at three different species. And you can see that each species is a little bit different in its HDL ratio. And we, we would consider these to be baseline stress levels. These are just turtles that we caught in the wild during the breeding season. Nothing particularly stressful happening to them. So this just kind of gives us an idea of, like, assuming it's a healthy population, this is what their baseline stress levels are. If we see um, this blue bar go up substantially during an algal bloom, that would indicate that these turtles are being stressed by the algal bloom. And then we're doing a few different tests to look at immune functioning. So if you've had immunology, you know that you have a couple different arms of your immune system, as we call them. So your innate immune system is just what responds to any invading body. Um, it's a pretty cheap immune response to mount. It doesn't require previous exposure to whatever thing you're fighting against. And so um, a really common test to measure innate immune function is what we call um, bacteria killing ability or bactericidal capacity. So we take, when we take a blood sample, we spin it down. We have a little field centrifuge. And it separates the plasma from the blood cells. And then we can incubate the plasma with E. coli. And you have in your plasma particles that can kill bacteria. They just have kind of innate bactericidal capabilities. And so this is a control plate where there was no turtle plasma. And you can see a bunch of little E. coli cap, um, colonies. This plate was incubated with turtle plasma. And you can see far fewer E. coli cap, um, colonies. So the proportion that were killed here compared to this control plate is that turtle's bactericidal capacity. Um, and we're also using a test that measures your antibodies in your, your blood cells, their ability to kind of glue themselves to and cut up foreign cells. So this is called a natural antibody agglutination test. And you just look at, you're basically looking at which um, dilution, at which dilution um, point you see this agglutination lysis start happening. So these are a couple pretty common tests to look at innate immune systems. Your adaptive immune system is a little bit more extensive, so that's the immune functioning that kicks in when you've been exposed to something in the past, and now you're seeing it again. Um, so you have to be exposed to something in the first place in order for this to, to kick in. And so this is your response to kind of a novel antigen that you're now hopefully going to be able to fight off in the future. And something that's a pretty common test here is what we call the phytohemagglutinin challenge. So we inject the, the toe webbing, in this is the map turtle toe, so um, between the fourth and fifth toe, which is right here. We inject their webbing with, it's called phytohemagglutinin. It's actually um, extracted from kidney beans. And it mimics a bacterial infection. And it just, it's an irritant. And so it just causes the skin webbing to kind of swell a little bit. And it mimics what you would do to fight off an infection. And so we inject them and then measure the skin swelling every six hours. And it kind of rises up and then peaks and drops off. And that amount of, of swelling in response to the irritant is a measure of their immune, their immune system activity. So this is um, data from uh, male and female painted turtles last year. You can see that females, the peak swelling response in both sexes was at about six hours. And then it kind of drops off. And you can see that females mounted a significantly larger swelling response than the males did. And we, we don't know why that is, but that's kind of interesting. And then Austin this year is also looking at a couple additional factors that could play into turtles' um, general health. So turtles carry a lot of parasites, just like other animals. There are turtle-specific leeches who specialize on you know, cold animals. 
Um, and turtles also grow algae on their shells and sometimes on their skin. So one of the reasons that turtles are thought to bask is to actually burn off some of these parasites and algae. Um, that hasn't really been proven, but that's a pretty common theory. And we think that if turtles have high leech loads or especially high algal growth loads, that that is maybe an indicator of poor habitat because they maybe don't have the opportunity to bask. So if you see sites um, where you're catching turtles who don't have logs or things to bask on, they tend to have a lot more algae on them. And so Austin's RU project is looking at whether algal loads or leech loads are correlated with either stress response or immune functioning. And he's actually also looking at blood parasites. He's found a pretty high prevalence of blood parasites in turtles as well, which is kind of cool. Um, so here you can see a turtle who really has very little algae, and then this is the bottom of a turtle who's got a lot of algae. I think it's this turtle, actually. Um, you can see really thick growth. This is like an inch long of algal filaments growing off of this turtle. So again, we don't have any results from this. I think Austin is like going through hundreds of microscope slides right now, um, counting blood cells and going blind from that. And so we finished our spring sampling period, I think, a week or two ago, and we're going to start back up again in about three or four weeks um, whenever an algal bloom starts happening. And we're going to do that for a couple weeks and, and add in some snakes and frogs as well. So, yeah, thanks to all these people, and I'm happy to take any questions. How many death sites did you have in the three different states? Um, it was really different. I think <coughs> Illinois was, well, I suppose New Mexico was like 12, just really very few. Minnesota was about 50, and Illinois, we have a huge crew, and it's a really dense area, so it was about 200. No one has really conclusively shown that it isn't. And there's like statistical theory that if you diverge from 50-50, it's your favor to go back to it because whichever sex is rare is more valuable. And females will, I don't know how, but they can somehow assess that and they will produce more of the rarer sex, which will make them have better fitness. And so statistically, it comes back to a 50-50 sex ratio. So the turtles sense an imbalance? In their Apparently. Body. Yeah, we have no idea how they know that or how they can assess that. Did but you try to test that in your pools, like where you no. weighted the male and female turtles that you could put in your sample? No, we, we aimed for 15 females and 5 males for each population. I think we did have 5 males for every population, but we didn't quite get to 15. I think there were two populations that we didn't quite have 15 females. So, But they, the females were already gravid, so I don't know at what point they assessed their surroundings. You know, maybe they were, I don't know if they were assessing the turtles in their pond in Iowa or if they had already assessed the sex ratio of the turtles where they came from. And yeah, we have no idea. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you would test that, but it would be, it would shed a lot of light on some important questions. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, where are you in New Mexico today? Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge? Okay. Yeah. Which is about half an hour south of Socorro. How much uh, variation is there within a nest for mm -hmm. sex ratio? Usually, they're, they're mostly all one or the other. Um, you sometimes have mixed sex ratios, but it's more common that it's all one or the other. They're, in painted turtles, their nests are so shallow that there isn't enough temperature variation. In like snapping turtles, where they have a deep nest, there will be like warm, you know, whatever it is, males up here and females at the bottom. But painted turtles are just not enough variation. It, it actually seems like, so in, in reptiles, a lot of things are controlled by incubation temperature, not just sex. So like, it, incubation temperature affects how big you get, how fast you grow, it affects social behavior, um, all kinds of things. And it turns out that the temperatures that produce males, for example, you can decouple the, the, the incubation temperature from the sex by treating eggs with hormones. And so people have done that, where you incubate eggs at male temperatures and turn them into females and incubate females at male temperatures and, and vice versa. And what they found is that males who are incubated at male temperatures are better 
is like bigger, faster, whatever, and actually have higher reproductive fitness than males who are incubated at female temperatures. And so whatever trait was better for males at whatever temperature, somehow it was selected for that, that um, the sex that was better was then selected to be produced at that temperature, if that makes sense. So it kind of, the sex and the trait became coupled so that they would both be produced at that whichever high or low temperature was better for that sex. So they've shown this in lizards pretty conclusively, and it, it seems to fit for turtles as well. Yeah. When you get to the hab stuff with the then under still in that part, what are you looking to measure the cause of a severe hab or not? Is it just the presence of the, the algae itself, or are you going to be measuring toxins? We're going to measure it? microcystin concentration okay. at, the, at the trapping site. Yeah, we don't really, and nobody's measured microcystin in these wetlands right along Lake Erie. They've only measured it in, you know, in physically in the algal bloom, so we don't know how concentrated the microcystin in the wetlands is going to be that comes in. So it may be too low to have much difference um, or much effect. So that's the plan. We're going to also be collecting carcasses if we find them and doing necropsies and stuff too. So yeah, this is very preliminary. <laughs> we, we're not sure if this design is going to tell us exactly what we want to know, but that's the idea. There's a researcher at the Med Campus of UT that's developing like a blood test to yeah. determine if microcystin has been in it. And they're looking at alkaline phosphatase yeah. activity because that's what the enzyme, that's what microcystin targets. Is in mice, right? Is what uh, yeah, he's doing it in mice. Okay. Would something like that be helpful for the turtle? Potentially. The I don't know how much of the enzymes are similar. Like, I don't know how highly conserved those are, if they would if they'd be the same system in turtles. We're also hoping, actually, to do an experiment on frogs to look at effects of, so frogs who are, we're actually hoping to, like, dunk them in microcystin and then see what happens to them when they try to hibernate and overwinter, because some of the frogs in Ohio overwinter by producing, basically, like, antifreeze with their livers, and it's a liver toxin. So we're expecting that it's going to have an effect on their overwintering ability. And we would see the same thing in turtles, although they don't produce glycerin. So yeah, again, we're just not sure if we're targeting the right, I guess, biomarker. Yeah, I, I think it's really cool that you're, you're studying the things that are not fish in the lake. Because yeah, well, that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully we can keep getting this funded, yeah. yeah the only one that's like heard that, you know, I always wonder, you know, what's the effect of the Think here. Right. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully we can see them here. <laughs> and I sort of had a related question, and you may have already answered it, but it's that has there been any previous work done to assess the vulnerability of, of species of herptiles to microcystin, or is it really Not that I know. There has been one study on Lake Taihu in China where basically they found, I think it was like ducks, turtles, there was another vertebrate too that had died and they all, like they did liver biopsies or whatever, and they could find high levels of microcystin in the liver. And that's the only thing that's known. So we don't know, and that's at the lethal effect, right? And so we have no idea what it's doing to them on sort of a sublethal, like just being in there exposed to it, what that's doing to them. Turtles are really tough. Like I've done some other equimmunology on turtles and things that are like hard on other species. Turtles really don't show a decrease in stress or our education immune function or an increase in stress. So if if they're being affected by this, then it's really serious because they're tough, robust animals. Great. We can thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. We've got about six or seven minutes if you want to get up, stretch, walk a little bit, and then we'll uh, introduce our guest speaker for uh, for the evening also. So we'll take a look. All right. We'll, we'll get going here again. Before we start in the guest lecture, I just want to check on our faculty that are here. So Darren, with limnology, how are we doing? Uh, real well. Uh, we've gotten to see a lot of the lake this summer because I added a new field trip. We went over to Maui Bay earlier in the spring, and then, or earlier in the semester, and then yesterday, today, sorry, so one day. Today we went to Sandusky Bay. Today we went to Sandusky Bay, and we seem to be seeing some bloom conditions starting to emerge. Doug, for you? Well, we uh, today 
we went to Duff's Woods and we saw a lot of poison ivy on the way there. <laughs> and then found a lot of mosquitoes. Well, but we were measuring trees and species composition, and we'll work up that data on Saturday. Got some folks here for our ecology class, and then James Marshall for evolution. Anything you want to update the class? Well, how's everything going? We are going to roll. We are going to roll. Around 7.30 tomorrow, we're going to try and catch some birds. We're going to hopefully see Child. He comes to us again from uh, the International Joint Commission or the IJC. Those of you sitting in the room got to uh, hear from Victor Service again. We mentioned that earlier. Um, but Matthew's going to kind of give us, as you can see, with some of the Great Lakes science and management. So the key role that the International Joint Commission, the IJC, plays in maintaining not only the Great, great Lakes, but all the, the boundary waters that connect us to uh, Canada. And so, again, Matthew, if you kind of give him a little idea of where you came from, how you got to where you're at, and uh, kind of your experiences through your academic career would be, sure. would be great. Sure, offer a few comments. Thanks, and so yeah. thank, thanks, Chris, for uh, the opportunity to be here. Thanks, Janine, for your talk, and highly relevant given the, uh, given the changes we're seeing in the lakes. And as the title suggests, I'm going to be talking, shifting it up and talking more about Great Lakes science and management, focused very specifically on how the U.S. and Canada work together on the Great Lakes issues that we're, we're seeing in the lakes, and in particular about the role of the IJC. And so my sort of journey to the IJC, and I, I, I like many people at the IJC, sort of joined mid-career. For me, the, the career path was quite circuitous if I reflect back on it. I, I did my undergrad in, uh, you know, focusing on, on soil science. I did a master's degree in environmental studies. And it was during that program that I got exposed to sort of management and policy kind of issues. And it was, for me, a very complementary um, program to the science-oriented undergrad that I had done. I then moved to the West Coast where my wife did her PhD and I worked for a while. And my wife is actually here in the audience with one of my kids, Sophie and, uh, and Susan are here. And it's a little weird for both of us having me offer a few remarks, but. We couldn't resist the draw of Putin Bay and the sort of mini vacation that this day has been for us. So um, when I started my career, I, I uh, worked as a, a consultant for a small consulting firm, did that for about five years. And that was really neat for me because I found working as a consultant, you get exposed to many different project types. You're writing proposals one day and field work the next and report writing the next. and so quite a bit of diversity. So reflecting back on it, that was a neat way for me to have started my career. We then re uh, returned to, um, to, uh, to Central Canada, to Ontario, where I worked for a regional resource management agency for 15 years, one of the conservation authorities. And these are agencies that don't have a direct equivalent here in, 
in the U.S. Perhaps the soil and conservation districts resemble them. Um, but these are very much sort of boots on the ground uh, agencies that do projects that make differences in people's daily lives in the region in which they're active. And that too for me was a lot of fun. I, I mostly worked on habitat restoration, uh, tributary water quality monitoring, and agricultural non-point source pollution remediation. Um, and then a position came uh, up at the IJC four or five years ago when I, uh, I got that job, and so I've been there for about that long. So for me, the path has been quite circuitous. And um, you know, so all I can really say about that is if I reflect back on the decisions I made about the opportunities that I took, I didn't, I reflected on them, I tried to make responsible decisions, but I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't sort of uh, reflect on the, them excessively, I didn't overthink them, I sort of followed my heart. And I found for me that's really worked out and I'm, I'm you know, very privileged to be here tonight talking about some of the work that uh, is happening binationally here in the basin. And uh, standing here with some familiarity of the International Joint Commission. So for me, it's been a fun ride so far. And again, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight. I must also say I had the best commute ever to get here. Um, Susan and Sophie and I showed up at the ferry terminal in Leamington, Ontario at, I don't know, 10.30 or something, nice leisurely morning. We took the ferry to Pelee Island, another ferry from Pelee Island to Sandusky, the Jet Express from Sandusky to Putin Bay, and then Chris picked us up at Putin Bay. So I had a three leg or something ferry right here, and uh, so it's been it's been just a wonderful day. We, we may take you on the ferry. We may take you on the ferry. Gibraltar <laughs> 3? Yeah, I noticed it. I thought, no, that's not a fishing vessel. I was saying that to Chris, I noticed that, and it's when I got here, and Chris was pointing it out, so that was a lot of fun, yeah. You said you were drinking on the boat, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I'll never tell. Right. Well, <laughs> they're safe with me. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought what I would do is give a, a, just a really, and a, a sort of, a, and I, I, uh, I'll acknowledge this, this presentation is quite ranging, and I, I hope for all of you there's something here of interest, and for, for some of you perhaps a, a great deal that's of interest. But I thought I'd just initially touch on the journey that, that we've taken here in the basin over the last hundred years to get to the point we're at in terms of bilateralism or binationalism in Great Lakes management. I'll talk at more length about the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, which is a really important agreement that exists here in the basin, particularly as uh, in, in, in through the two countries working together and all that entails. I'll talk about IJC's roles and activities. And then as, as, as time permits, I'll offer some more specific comments on some Lake Erie work we've been doing to hopefully kind of bring it to life um, uh, bring some of my earlier remarks to light. So, uh, sort of the history of, of, of bilateralism in, in, Great, in Great Lakes management can really be tracked back to the period of, of our country's histories where the resources of both countries, the U.S. and Canada, were being accessed and, and, and used to build our respective nations. You know, well over 100 years ago, there was substantial harvesting of, 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 of timber, of, of minerals, of fur bearers, industries, you know, developing to process those raw materials to support the communities that were increasingly growing in, in the Great Lakes Basin. And it was during that period that larger cities around the basin really began to have impacts on our shared water resource and our air resources, et cetera, that extended well beyond the physical um, boundaries of those communities. In Cleveland and, and, and Hamilton and the, and the greater Toronto area are perhaps good examples of that. In the West, there were significant issues of water quantity and settlers in Montana and, and, uh, and, and uh, one or more of the Canadian provinces were building competing irrigation canals for uh, agricultural purposes that uh, really created some tensions around water quantity. Uh, back here in the Great Lakes Basin at Niagara Falls, there were developments for hydroelectric power that really um, caused uh, a lot of um, concern and consideration around other uses of the water resource, not only environment, but things like navigation, for example. And so a lot of issues that just sort of intersected around that time, and it was in 1909 that the legislatures of both countries um, uh, entered into a Boundary Waters Treaty, and you can see here from the purpose of the, um, the treaty, it was really quite visionary at the time, and, and was very bold and far-reaching. Um, the, the, the treaty then talks about the 
um, and provide sort of um, guidance and a framework around which both countries manage, jointly manage water resources that cross the boundary, the Canada-US boundary. And to this day, it's considered one of the best examples of two countries um, laying out a framework for the co-management of a water resource. And a lot of scholarship, a lot of scholarship around the Boundary Waters Treaty has been around for well over 100 years ago, and it is regarded as one of the best examples of bilateral water management that exists anywhere on the globe, and, and arguably continues to today. So these are the these are the watersheds that are uh, that are. Uh, of, of, that the uh, Boundary Waters Treaty uh, applies to. You can see it exists from east to west, including the, uh, the, the shared uh, um, waters in the north. You can see that the Great Lakes Basin is by far the largest of all of those, and also by far the most populous. There's some 40 million Americans and Canadians who live and reside in the Great Lakes Basin. And so consequently, a lot of the focus of the treaty and the work of the governments uh, on our transboundary water resources focused on the Great Lakes Basin. A lot of the work of the IJC is commensurately focused on the Great Lakes Basin because of the important, importance of that basin uh, in, in, in the continental context. The Boundary Waters Treaty also uh, not only laid out uh, a framework by which the two governments would cooperate to manage the resource, but it also established as an independent commission, an advisor to the governments, the International Joint Commission. And so it's uh, in the day it established two offices in Washington and Ottawa. And this is actually, um, this third bullet here could really be the topic of an entire presentation at a time like this. Although the, uh, the treaty did lay out a regulatory role for the IJC as it relates to levels and flows, uh, its um, role with respect to water quality is strictly advisory. The governments don't have to accept the uh, suggestions of the, of the IJC when it comes to water quality. It's strictly advisory. With respect to quantity, levels, and flows, um, that usually applies to hydroelectric dams and other full-spanning full structures. And that's a very topical issue here in the basin right now. We're experiencing you know, record high uh, level water levels here in the basin on, on all of the lakes pretty much. <coughs> Um, I'll just offer a quick comment on, on the issue of water quantity because I think there are some misperceptions out there. Um, but there's roughly, there's, well, there's, there's, there's three locations in the Great Lakes Basin when there's an ability to um, manage flows through dams. Um, the first is at St. Mary's where Superior uh, outlets into Huron and, and uh, that is a full spanning structure. There's a partial spanning structure on the Niagara River where there isn't an ability to alter upstream levels and flows appreciably because the structure doesn't extend from bank to bank. It's only a partial um, spanning structure. And then further down, uh, once Lake Ontario outlets to the St. Lawrence River, there's the Moses Sanders Dam, which is a full, full spanning structure. The structures at, at, um, at, uh, at uh, the Moses Sanders Dam and at the St. Mary's River Managing those dams allows for no more than two or three inches of water level manipulation. We know that the system uh, uh, is variable up to five or six feet. And so you can appreciate that the ability for humans to manage water levels is very, very small in relation to the primary driver of water levels, which are natural processes. Rainfall directly onto lakes, rainfall into watersheds, and then into the lakes, evaporative losses, et cetera. So again, I think there's a misperception that management of dams differently could make a big difference to water levels, and that's simply not correct. So I won't say any more about water quantity or levels and flows tonight, but I wanted to offer that comment given the period in which we're in. So returning to water quality then, um, the, the, and, and the IJC, we've got six commissioners. Three are appointed by the president, Senate confirmed. Uh, that takes a while, uh, although we had a change in administration here in the U.S., as you know, in January, it'll probably be typically 12 or 13 months for commissioners to change following administration coming in. There's many more higher priority positions to get appointments in before the IJC. Although the IJC is, is uh, I, think the, I think of the 4,000 appointees that an incoming president, uh, appointments that an incoming president um, makes, about 1,200 of them get Senate confirmed, and IJC is in that category. So IJC is in the top quartile, uh, is, is sort of that way, one way of thinking of it. Um, three 
Canadians are appointed by the Prime Minister. And so there's three plus three. They take an oath of impartiality. So they commit to serve the interests of the transboundary resource, not to serve the interests of their government. Does that always work? Arguably, sometimes it doesn't, but most of the time it does. And I think particularly lately, um, there's much evidence to suggest that it does. Uh, so some operating principles then of the commission, they're independent. There's equality between two countries. Some of the scholarship I mentioned about the Boundary Waters Treaty actually is observed that it's a pretty big coup for Canada to get the treaty because a much less populous, much less powerful country was given equal footing with the, with the U.S., with three commissioners each. And so I thought that, I find that quite interesting. Um, we um, tried to deliver sound science advice to the government through extensive reliance on advisory boards. We've got over 20 advisory boards across the transboundary. Uh, we've got four or five of them here in the Great Lakes Basin. I'll touch on them in a bit. And we have a significant commitment to stakeholder uh, and uh, input and public engagement. We routinely try to get out to, to, to communities, to, to, to groups, to constituencies like this, to talk about some of our work. We routinely try to have meetings in communities to talk about specific issues. <coughs> Much of the work of the first half century of the IJC's existence was centered around water quantity related issues and some of the large infrastructure that was proposed for hydroelectric development, et cetera. The IGC had a role in that, as I mentioned that earlier. We did do some water quality work. We did some, a fairly significant water quality study and sort of was published in 1918 that looked at the water quality across the transboundary. But it was in the 60s as the, the Great Lakes were in, in serious uh, ecological distress. You know, four fire, four rivers in the system uh, ignited due to contaminants to honor in the water column. This is a more recent photo, but the algae blooms of the uh, 60s and 70s were very severe. It was a time when there was a growing environmental movement, you know, sort of a social movement. Uh, it was a time when both countries independent of IJC uh, and, and our advice established their own national environmental agencies. Um, but something that the government did do in the 60s with that was, which was to ask the IJC to have a look at the causes and potential um, uh, approaches to addressing the water quality issues in the Great Lakes. And one of the things the IJC said is that there needs to be a sustained focus on the lakes. There can't be a one-off. There's got to be a sustained commitment between countries to address this enormously important transboundary watershed. Getting back to that earlier slide of all of them, you know, the Great Lakes are the, are the big one. And to that end, the, 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 the Governments did sign the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. The father of our current Prime Minister uh, signed the original agreement. It's been renewed five times since then, most recently in 2012. Every iteration of the agreement has added, tended not to subtract, but added and elaborated and enlarged the scope of the agreement. And uh, so, for example, the 2012 version had a focus on climate change, to, to, you know, Thinking of the previous talk, you know that, that quite a in, that, that was a significant step forward, um, and so we're now on our fifth version. It identifies nine general objectives. These are sort of the the endpoints that the governments commit to trying to accomplish here in the basin. Uh, so everything from drinking water to, to to swimmability, fishability, drinkability kind of themes, pollutants, habitats, nutrients, invasives, groundwater. Um, there's also, uh, very importantly, I didn't list them here, but there's also 10 annexes, which make up about half of the agreement. And if you have an opportunity, I encourage you to access this document. It's really not that long. Um, if you're having trouble sleeping, you know, it's a <laughs> wonderful reading. Um, you can probably get through it in about an hour. Um, anyway, there's 10 annexes that make up the second half of this, this agreement. And each of those annexes is, is sort of a mini action plan for what the government with their states, provinces, other stakeholders intend to do around a particular theme. And the, and the climate change annex is one of them. Um, and there's, there's many others dealing with each of the significant resource values or stressors that exist for the basin. And it's really important that we have an agreement like this because as I don't need to tell you, it is a tangle of organizations and agencies here in the basin, an absolute tangle. And that partly is a positive thing in that it's a reflection of how highly evolved we are here in the Great Lakes Basin 
compared to other transboundary watersheds. Um, but this, so this, which I, um, you can't see it on, it's just on the bottom, I, I, I borrowed from the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. There's a whole other side to this sheet, which is the academic sector. So keep in mind there's a significant um, emphasis uh, in, in understanding the system that isn't reflected here uh, as strongly as it could be. And all of these public and non-government and indigenous organizations often have significant partnerships and interrelationships with universities that isn't depicted here. But just from the purpose of more the management and policy side, um, as well as uh, monitoring and surveillance, and I circled Sea Grant and IJC just to give you a sense of, you know, although uh, particularly Sea Grant is, you know, a significant program across the entire uh, basin and beyond. Um, and so you just get a sense of how how many agencies and organizations there are. And I, I point this out to you because many of your students, you're sort of thinking, hey, well, one day I obviously want to apply my skills and abilities in a, in a, in a, in a paid environment. And so all of these organizations, they hire environmental staff. Many of them have interns. Many of them have fellows, et cetera. And, and these are organizations that you might be thinking about and thinking too, um, depending on your interest. So you've obviously got federal and state agencies. I'll focus on the U.S. side of the equation here. Um, indigenous uh, peoples and organizations across the basin, uh, I, I think, are already have a, a, a significant amount of, uh, of, of influence here on the U.S. side. I think there's a growing amount of influence on the Canadian side with our current um, administration. Uh, many of them both hire and engage non-Indigenous individuals. They, they obviously have a focus on Indigenous as well. But, but they do a lot of really important work. And the role of traditional ecological knowledge and the traditional Western science that we spend much of, or I spend much of my time thinking about um, is, is something I find quite fascinating and something I think we need to advance. Um, there's binational organizations, both uh, both uh, non-government and government, and then of course there's uh, domestic non-government organizations, and the marine transportation um, sector as well um, has quite a bit of activity around uh, Great Lakes uh, Great Lakes Science and Management as well. So the other thing that the 1978 version of the agreement did, which is sort of in the second of five revisions, it established a third office of the IJC. And the governments, uh, if they were to focus in a more coordinated fashion on the Great Lakes, wanted the IJC to beef up in this area as well. And so they directed us to establish a third office that is in Windsor, Ontario. Um, it focuses almost exclusively the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Don't ask me about Soros or the Milk or St. Croix. You know, I, I don't know anything about those watersheds. The Great Lakes are the work we do here, uh, do in out of our Great Lakes regional office. It's quite a small office. I'm one of seven scientists. There's a director. There's a public affairs officer who helps, who um, rather gets scientists to help with, you know, advancing some of her priorities. And then we have support staff. We do have interns. Um, because we're in Canada, to be honest, we tend to hire from Canadian universities. It's just simpler for us. But we do have a partnership with Michigan Sea Grant. We hire one fellow a year out of the Michigan Sea, sea Grant program. And that individual joins us. They typically are recent graduates from master's programs. They join us for a full year. They're paid fairly. And we immerse them in the work of the IJC. And they always leave with at least one thing they can hold up and say, I, I, I did this. I produced this when I was at IJC, in addition to getting involved in some other things. Truly by national office, um, I'm Canadian, but I um, count half my colleagues as Americans. They literally commute from Detroit, and we, you know, they love it. They get, you know, a pint and a half of beer for their U.S. dollar. When I'm only getting <laughs> <laughs> my money, but um, the uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement has three primary roles assigned to the IJC: offering advice to the government. This is this this is the the activity we take very seriously. Um, we every third year we assess the progress of the government. They produce their own reporting that says, okay, this is what we've done, and it's because of the work we do that we've accomplished these out outcomes in the lakes. And we assess whether their programs are in fact driving those improvements or deteriorations in some case cases, or, or whether there's other factors that are in play there. And then, as I've said, public outreach is always a focus of ours. So we have these advisory boards. There's um, 
I think 21 across the transboundary. We, we do have advisory boards for those three, three flow control structures that I talked about earlier. And these are engineers typically, and they um, concern themselves with, uh, you know, based on meteorological data and, you know, other considerations. You know, what, what, how open should the gates be? We've got to consider upstream and downstream conditions, all that kind of thing. We also have four water quality and environmental quality um, advisory boards. And, and I, I've, I've listed them on the next two slides. These are binational boards. They're, um, I think, relatively prestigious appointments. Um, they're the, the very best minds in their field who are also interested in serving. And there is some work and effort to, to, uh, to, to be involved in one of these. And, and Chris is someone who's on our research coordination committee. So you'd know much more about the commitment and so on and so, on and so forth than I would on that, Chris. There may be others in the room who are ha have had some involvement in, with our boards or work groups. I'm always amazed at, at how many people have come into contact with IGC this way. So I spend most of my, roughly two thirds of my time supporting the Science Priority Committee of the Science Advisory Board. That's why it's listed first, not because it's best, but just because it's near and dear to my heart. We have five ongoing projects right now. I've just tried to list them descriptively here. I won't talk about each of those, but it hopefully gives you a sense of the diversity of the work that group's doing. This is the Blue Sky Science, I call it the Blue Sky Science um, Advisory Board, mostly academics, mostly people who think about both emerging and current stressors and threats, and what are some of the things that we can do about it. The Research Coordination Committee, which, which Chris is a, membership, uh, a member of, are more the operational science managers, so uh, academic agency um, uh, uh, science program managers who are very involved in the coordinating research amongst groups and institutions, uh, ensuring that um, the science work that's being done is, is effective in terms of investments and efficient in terms of mobilization of equipment and vessels and staff and all that kind of thing. And there's some projects that are being done. You can see that we work closely as a board on, on, on individual projects. And, and, and Chris, I don't know if you concur with this at all, but I, I think over the last little while, the two committees of the board have been communicating you know, more regularly, and I think that there's a lot of good synergy happening there. We also have a, although the water quality board name may not communicate this, it's a policy board. These are the mostly government agency policy program managers who participate, and, uh, and, and, and I, I should reframe that. It used to be almost exclusively government. Now it's much more diverse. So we've got um, some indigenous uh, membership. Uh, we've got um, some non-government membership. We've got some industry membership. These are people who think in terms of sort of management and policy kind of programming. And uh, then we have a health professionals advisory board, as the name suggests. They're more uh, focused on human health, so physicians, epidemiologists, public health folks. So again, you know, roughly 14 to, to, to 14 or so people per board. The water quality board's a little bigger. 50-50 by national, 50 U.S., 50 um, Canadian in terms of percent representation. So that's um, my sort of, um, in a half hour, my, um, you know, relaying sort of how the, the countries have, have worked together to, to develop this bilateral approach to resource management here in the basin, the role of the IJC in some of that. What I thought I'd try to do, and I worry a little bit hearing the, um, the, the student presentations and discussion earlier, is this, this, this isn't going to be that enlightening to any of you, but what I thought I'd try to do is bring some of uh, this to life by giving you, presenting essentially a case study. So since I have a little bit of time left on the clock and uh, Lake Erie is just uh, not more than a handful of meters from here, um, perhaps I will talk to you a little bit about uh, our Lake Erie Ecosystem Priority, or LEAP, um, which uh, I know when Victor was here uh, two or three weeks ago, um, he talked um, about, uh, substantially about indicators and about, you know, what are the suite of indicators that uh, monitoring and surveillance programs are, are developed around to help us answer the question, how are the lakes doing? Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? This is a slide which is relatively hot off the press. It was just two, three weeks ago that um, the government uh, issued their uh, State of the Great Lakes uh, report. 
Um, the last one was issued in uh, roughly 2014. The story was very similar. And I just want to point out, as all of you know, all we, we all know that of the five lakes, Lake Erie is the most perturbed. And it is uh, in the uh, examining the suite of nine indicators and uh, 44 or so sub-indicators that uh, are, uh, make up those, those nine indicators. It is the only of the f five lakes that is uh, deteriorating in condition. And again, this is across a suite of indicators. And uh, I won't get into the detail of that because I know Victor did um, not too long ago. This is, I think, largely why, um, four or five years ago, five years ago now, the Commission, in, when they, as they do, and as many organizations do, periodically sit down to reflect on the priorities for the coming period. Um, the IJC, with input from advisory boards and others, um, identified three priorities that uh, continue through more or less to present. Uh, we're wrapping up some of these now. Um, and obviously, one of them was this Lake Erie Ecosystem Priority Relief. Um, uh, not all of the work we do falls into one of these three baskets, but a lot of it does. And if you look at those advisory board projects I showed you a few minutes ago, you know, many of them you can sort of see would slot at least partially into one of these three baskets. So, so the, the LEAP effort is one that we've been working on now for several years, and, and some of our advisory board work continues to focus on this nutrient threat in Lake Erie. Um, the work is very complementary to um, the work being under taken by others, and you're all very familiar with just how crowded this field is. Um, there is so much work. I mean, so it's a, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful problem, if you will, to have to try to understand all the work that's being done in this basin. Um, so these are just a few significant efforts that um, there's many others, um, but I want to acknowledge that. And I very, very importantly, I want to make, you know, really emphasize that the IJC, as we do for all of our projects, you know, we don't do original research. We don't go out onto the lake. We don't say, we're go back to the lab. We, we rely on existing science. We synthesize the science that we're able to access through the literature, through reports, through meetings and workshops of specialists. We rely very heavily on our advisory boards to try to bring that information together conceptually. And through that synthesis, usually, we're able to find some areas some gaps where one country is doing something differently than the other, where there's something that neither country is doing and perhaps ought to be doing. Um, and so it's that synthesis function that uh, I think is really something that IJC brings um, as, a, as a primary focus to these types of issues. Um, as we all know, um, Lake Erie's got three basins. It's obviously the, 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 the uh, the, uh, the symmetry and the morphology of the system of the lake that, that largely drives some of the, the issues we're seeing in each of the basins related to nutrients in particular now. I won't talk about central basin hypoxia or um, the uh, nuisance algae issues in the east basin. Um, my, my comments here tonight will be primarily focused on the west basin halves. I see Janine, you and I shop for our photos so of <laughs> similar location. Um, and so, you know, this is the issue that's been resurgent in the last many years. There's got a lot of people um, concerned, a lot of people thinking about it. And so what we did in around 2014 is we brought together this, the available science in the day, we published a report, and now we're doing a deeper dive in a couple of sort of um, gaps that we identified during that period. But I'll talk about the work that we did in around 2014 here for the balance of the minutes I have left. It's important because, as we know, as uh, others have spoken of, uh, HABs affect people um, very in a very serious way. Um, and uh, I guess all the uh, speakers bring their families, Janine, it would appear. It's younger and younger. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so the, uh, there was a do not drink, obviously, just up the coast here in Toledo, a lesser publicized one in a very small community in Ontario, uh, but no less serious for that community. Um, and it's not just that um, there's economic costs and, and inconvenience and the risk of uh, human health implications there. But for me, the most disappointing thing about these events is that people turn their backs on the lake. They disconnect from the lake. They don't view it as a resource, as a source of life and enjoyment and, and, and spirituality and whatever it is that floats your boat when it comes to lakes. 
they view it as a, uh, a, a, a polluted water body, and they turn their back and they disconnect. And so it's something that I know we all are united in, and the reason we're you know doing the work we do. Um, so you know, very serious issue. And so this LEAP effort uh, tried to synthesize available science to focus on phosphorus and algae reduction. Um, there is a significant uh, amount of effort, uh, uh, appropriate effort around nitrogen in the system as well, and I, I acknowledge that. Um, but our, our work did focus on phosphorus. Uh, and again, so causes and controls, advice to governments. Our science advisory board created a, a cleverly acronymed uh, Taking Action on Lake Erie work group and commissioned a series of, uh, of research papers, some of which were done by uh, faculty at various universities, a couple of private sector consultants, contributed a couple others. There was, I think it was six or seven. I didn't list them all here. Um, and then brought that information together uh, in a expert workshop that was held you know, very well attended by a diversity of, of, of people with expertise in this area, and then a report was issued. And so the report really summarized, and this is where I'm getting into the territory where I think it's you know more familiar to all of you than I uh, expected it would be. So um, bear with me, but this obviously just shows the significant, and you know, in credit to to, uh, to to governments, to municipalities in particular to all actors for the reductions in, in total phosphorus loads that we've seen in the lake since the severe uh, eutrophication of the late 60s, early 70s. The other big change we've seen, of course, is the, um, the point source fraction. Uh, see the colors too perfectly from here. The point source fraction, it, I'm sorry, the point source fraction and the non-point source fraction was roughly equal back in the day now much more largely driven by the non-point source fraction, the watershed inputs, primarily from agricultural land, but not just from agricultural land. And in fact, the, a more recent period of record shows this non-point source fraction at being you know, roughly two-thirds. These are the directly monitored tributaries. A lot of great work being done. I mean, Tiffin, uh, pardon me, Heidelberg University in Tiffin, Ohio, is uh, probably has the best tributary monitoring data set in uh, certainly in the basin as far as I know and perhaps continentally. It's a really important testament to the importance of long-term monitoring and the power of a large data set that's temporally uh, extensive. Um, the municipal and indirect municipal sewage treatment plants and other uh, uh, combined sewer overflows, other, uh, other uh, municipal infrastructure contributing a significant proportion but much smaller proportion and then much smaller contributions from the, the Upper Lakes. Lake Huron, of course, receives the signal from Michigan and Superior as well, and atmospheric deposition directly onto the lakes uh, as well. There's work done by University of Michigan and others that really does a good job of understanding the relative influence of different, uh, these are external sources of phosphorus from external sources of non-point source uh, phosphorus. And you can see from the thickness of the lines, the Maumee is by far the largest contributor. The Sandusky, Cuyahoga um, are also significant. The, the Detroit River is, is roughly 50-50 in terms of the load of the Maumee, but the Maumee, as you all know, is a much, much higher concentration. Uh, although it's a big system, it's a small system compared to the Detroit. And so the Maumee is uh, much higher concentrations of, uh, of, of total phosphorus, algae response to concentration. Um, whereas the Detroit is much, much lower concentration. And even due to the hydrodynamics of the West Basin, there's some evidence that suggests that it would move relatively quickly out into the Central Basin. And so it may actually be playing a larger role in Central Basin hypoxia than West Basin has. So it, the Maumee is, is, uh, is, is regarded as the, uh, you know, the, the watershed where the, the sort of, the, if you will, the, the spatially the highest management priority with other agricultural watersheds as uh, uh, playing a, a, a role as, as well. I think those are the main points I want to talk about there. The other factor is, of course, the relative increase in influence of the dissolved fraction of the total phosphorus load. And, and, and this, uh, these data, from again, from Heidelberg, um, show that in the mid to late 90s, there's a significant increase in many of the systems, including you know the Maumee, Sandusky, and others. Um, unit area load uh, is is increasing um, 
as a proportion of, of total phosphorus uh, in, in, in recent years. And that's um, believed to be uh, at least partly due to changes in agricultural practices um, that are driving those, driving those conditions. And you know, I've really come to appreciate just how, I, I, th I think there's a tendency for some to sort of vilify the agricultural community, and I, 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 I think that's to a large degree wrong-headed. Uh, my feeling is, and you know, this is partly informed by the work I did back with the Conservation Authority for all those years, is that a large majority of producers are very responsible. They're astute business individuals. They understand that inputs cost money. It's in their interest to, to apply them responsibly. There's good agronomic practices that ensure the long-term viability of farms. And in my experience, in Ontario at least, the large majority of producers are are, uh, are conducting themselves responsibly, but not all are. And so, you know, that's the issue. How do we get at that issue? And I'll offer a comment on that in a moment. Um, so we were, we released our report in 2014, and um, I've touched, I think, on all of these except for maybe the last point, which is that the spring period is uh, highly predictive of the uh, proceeding algal bloom. Uh, and you know, Chris and, and others will have more to say about that, that one week from today. Um, so one of the things that we did in our in our report, and I'll only focus on one of the recommendations. Uh, there were many, uh, well, 16 or something. But the one I wanted to highlight was um, this. Uh, one of the recommendations we made was uh, so the question is, okay, so we've got a problem in Lake Erie. We've got we've got harmful gobble wounds that can can be very severe. What are the load reductions we need to achieve to get to a mild or, you know, an, a, an acceptable bloom condition? And so there's been a lot of good work that, that the advisory boards were able to access that assess both modeled as well as observed um, relationships between cyanobacterial index, which is Rick Stump will be talking about next week. It's essentially a, a measure of the severity of the algal, harmful algal bloom. And, and I couldn't explain it in, in detail. Others here might be able to. Um, uh, against the uh, the spring load, and again, this is for the mommy um, uh, total phosphorus load uh, against the spring load. And using this relationship, uh, and uh, essentially making a management call that we want a mild bloom condition, you can actually it it actually reveals the um, the load uh, based on the, the load response curve, the load that you need to achieve. You know what the load that you're currently putting into the lake, or within some degree of uncertainty, because of the monitoring, and and, and because of the monitoring work that's being done, you can actually start to quantify the load reduction. And so through that process, we did um, recommend a 40% uh, reduction in the West Basin. Um, there's a lot of sort of Variation in 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 this in these bullets, but the the essence of the our recommendation was a 40% reduction um, for West Basin um, harmful algal blooms, and um, that uh, so that that was a recommendation that we we made. And so the question is, okay, so so what so what happened? Did it make any difference? Well, it it actually before I a bit of suspense here, I'm going to delay my response to my question just for one slide. We also touched on a number of other um, recommendations. Many of them were just on um, uh, on uh, improving, sharpening the current paradigm, which both our countries rely on largely with the agricultural sector, which is one of a incentive-based approach, where we provide technical expertise and financial incentives to producers to uh, improve their management abilities, everything from helping with the costs of manure storages, to improved equipment, uh, to any number of uh, improvements, both structural and uh, and otherwise, um, to to try to more sharply focus on these findings that the science synthesis uh, showed. So I, I list those here. Um, we also believe at IJC because of the fact that there are still some bad actors, that there needs to be a stronger regulatory underpinning for agriculture. And there is a bar at which everyone must be above. And without that bar, we worry that the improvements we can get through the voluntary actions won't be enough. And I think 
to some degree, our experience here in Lake Erie has proved that or, or is, is, supports that because we, we don't have a lake that's in substantial recovery where conditions are improving, despite the fact we're spending a lot of time and effort on the kinds of incentive programming that they're so well developed here uh, amongst two very affluent nations. So um, some of those regulatory interventions, these aren't popular with some folks, but you know, it is what it is. Um, we put them out there and, and, and there's others talking about them as well and others who have done much more detailed work on these than we have. Um, so getting back to, so what, you know, so what? So you release this report and, you know, I'll just use, I'll continue with the 40% load reduction example. You know, what, what happened? Well, as it turns out, um, the, the uh, Annex 4 of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, which addresses nutrients, has a lot of, you know, smart, thoughtful, capable people who are working with, with both government and academic individuals who've come together, much like an advisory board model, to think about the same issue uh, around the same time, we think got to some of our conclusions a little sooner. And through their own analysis, they essentially, you know, um, uh, identified the 40% reduction as, as, as um, the, the reduction that is most likely to result in an acceptable bloom condition most of the time. And the three, uh, the two great states of Ohio and Michigan, along with Ontario, well, even put together their own collaborative agreement, which speaks about this 40% um, reduction and, and uh, acknowledging it's going to be darn tricky. They sort of, I think, frame it as aspirational, but nonetheless, they, they made this commitment politically to this 40% reduction. So the question then becomes, well, if IJC had, hadn't done its work, would this have happened? And, and I would suggest absolutely not. You know, the governments would have got to 40% independent of IJC because they access the same science we did. They access the same thought leaders, the same models. There's only eight or nine of them, uh, and they, they access all that same information. But what I think IJC did do is they lit a fire under some chairs and they got things moving more quickly. I think what IJC did do is they put some good information together they got some of the right people talking about these issues sooner, and it was essentially some, a nice sort of term paper for the, for, the, for, the, for the Annex 4 committee to then begin to work with. And so I think at some levels, there was significant benefit to the work, but uh, that notwithstanding, because this is all science-led and driven, um, you know, these results, I think, would have been, uh, would have been uh, converged on eventually anyway. So, and I hope, Chris, I'm, this, is, uh, this is a screen grab off of last week's uh, HAB bulletin. So this is, this, is, this is public. It's out there, as, as, as I think perhaps all of us know, or many of us uh, know of, with, um, with Heidelberg and Sea Grant, um, uh, are, are uh, th through models, and, and uh, in particular understanding the relationship of spring discharge of the Maumee River and, uh, and total, bio age, total, total bioavailable phosphorus load um, are able to make some predictions about the um, severity of the bloom that's likely in the coming growing season. And due principally to a very wet May, uh, and you can see the uptick in, in, in the month of May, um, the, the bloom is likely to be quite quite severe and, and there'll be a, a much better and, and, and more refined um, analysis of this just a, a week, you know, to almost to the moment uh, in this room. So look for that and, you know, Chris, I know that you can access it by webinar and I'll, I'll certainly be, be listening. Uh, actually, I guess it's more of an afternoon visit, isn't it? But, but anyway, um, so the wonderful, um, wonderful uh, effort, informative effort. A lot of other really exciting work happening. Many in the room are, are working on, in fact, all of you, from what I was hearing earlier, are working on um, the, you know, the predictive power of science now to inform everything from people's interactions with the lakes to drinking water intakes. It's not just abs. I mean, there's hypoxia work being done around drinking water intakes. It's just wonderful to see. So, um, so we're perhaps headed towards a moderately severe uh, harmful algal bloom this year. And, and as uh, was stated, and I noticed on the ride south through the lake there, I had noticed as I approached the U.S. shoreline, I, I did start to see some evidence of that as well. So rather than end on a sort of depressing note, I thought I would try to offer a few hopeful comments, and these are more geared to the students in the room. The others, forgive me for, 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 for uh, 
Well, you, you can tune out if you haven't already. Um, the, uh, the a few my my advice to you as 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 students who have uh, obviously keen interest and ability in this material. And I, I can't tell you. I said to a couple of people how exciting it was to listen to the research projects that six or seven of you summarized before this. Um, the diversity and the sophistication of your work is is very impressive, and I. I can tell you in my second or third or fourth or whatever year of undergraduate education, I never could have sounded that smart. So, uh, so way to go. So, um, you know, my advice would be to stay informed and you know pay attention to the right information. There's obviously a lot of not so good information out there. Um, uh, your passion is, uh, I find it energizing. Please don't lose that. Um, uh, one of the things that I've always really enjoyed about this sector is the passion that people have for their work, and I. You know, I have siblings, I have friends who work in other sectors, and they, they just don't get excited about their work. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, at, least, at least not all the time. Occasionally they do. But I, I really uh, would encourage you to stay passionate. It's a lot of fun interacting with the resource that we do and, and knowing at the end of the day some of what we do will uh, perhaps some, have some influence out there. Um, please advocate, perhaps more in your, in your country now than ever. Um, uh, you know, correspond with, with people in decision-making roles with your congressmen and women, you know, if you have a view to issues, please get them out there, you know, make them well-informed and, 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 and argue persuasively. It's really important right now that that occurs. Um, engage. I, the point here I think I wanted to make is I know it's tricky finding paid work, and, and uh, uh, I know all of you will do it. Uh, if you haven't already, you will eventually. But I also just wanted to relay that in the in the sort of entry level or junior or whatever um, position hiring processes I've been involved in, and I've had quite a few now over the years, um, it's often the volunteer part of the resume that separates folks. Um, and so that's something to think about. Um, you know, if you don't have success finding paid work, consider volunteers, and it can really make a difference down the road. Um, and, and on a related note, if you ever get a chance to do an interview, even though interviews are, you know, they make you nervous and they're no fun and you have to prepare and, and all that stuff, I'd encourage you to participate in as many as you can because every time your skills improve and one of these, you know, eventually it's really going to matter. You're really going to want that opportunity and you'll be better at it. Um, and then finally, just take small actions. I, I, I was just going to offer the perspective that there's something that all of us can do in our in our own time to improve our properties or talk our parents or our friends into doing something differently and, and those small actions are important and and uh, of course enjoy the ride because um, it's uh, it's important and, and, and it's fun and so with that I'll conclude and um, I thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 uh, I am aware of that, and it is of keen interest. Uh, the IJC, it's, a, it's a, just a sort of a characteristic of the IJC. Because we are a binational organization, we tend not to get into protracted comment on domestic decision making, even though it can affect the larger body of water. And there's reasons for that that I can elaborate uh, uh, about about later. But but given the capacity of our organization, et cetera, we've tended to focus on those truly binational decisions, decisions both governments can take, or at least multiple gover governments can take. But I agree with your observation that it's uh, it's on the face of it of, of it worrisome, and it sort of gets to the regulatory side, you know, that I was in a slightly different context that I was talking about, and I think I think that's very important. And it's a good example of the sort of thing that, um, you know, the more people that raise concern about that, you know, the more likely it is to be considered differently next time. Uh, and, and good I think question. We need to be clear that that's the Ohio. Region. Yeah, that's, that's right. Not the U.S. That's yeah. Different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just so everybody. Yeah. yeah, it's a good clarification, Doug. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm going to try to approach something or suggest something that I think really the answer would, would be, you know, worked out in an academic journal, but I'm just curious about the perspective from the IJC in terms of maybe feedback you're getting with the load, redu with the load reduction ideas. 
So I, I think in retrospect, looking back at, at the idea of load reduction, I think I, I pers my personal opinion is that the load reduction was not the right way to approach the problem and that maybe it should have been a concentration reduction. And the reason I present that is as a farmer, I really have no control over rain. And, and, and actually going all the way back to Stump's model, really his best predictor was simply discharge. And so as a farmer, I can't predict, I can't control how much rain we get in a year. And so in some regards, my control over the load is limited only to the concentration that I let. And if, you know, ultimately the best practice, their, their, their management strategies are going to be, I think, attacking concentrations or things that are leaving their land, but they're powerless to the discharge term. So I'm wondering if you get any feedback from, from those types of stakeholders in terms of how are we going to deal with this? Yeah, and it, it's a it's a great point, and and I I uh, I am aware of the debate, and I I think to some degree, it speaks to the relative complexity of understanding what the load reduction uh, should be versus the concentration reduction. So you know there 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 is a there is a load reduction that can be identified, um, and. You know, I guess it's arguable uh, in terms of what producers can do. Uh, you know, many of the BMPs um, are targeted on on retaining discharges on you know on the farm, and by you know promoting understanding and promoting those kinds of BMPs, then there can be uh, commensurate load reductions. So that was, I think it was it was partly because the, I think the science was there a little better, and that's, that's arguable, and also that there you know, might be more tangible interventions that can be pursued to address that load reduction. And so I think those are the reasons that we went in that direction. I know that uh, Chris, your predecessor, Jeff Reuter, who was on the, on the uh, Annex 4 um, Load Reduction Task Force that produced that 2015 uh, government report that I spoke of, um, I know that was a lot of discussion within that nutrient annex task group as well. So it'd be interesting to get that, you know, their perspective on I, that. I as think well. you're right. I think that was kind of where the science, the best science at the time, yeah. was pointing. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think that went that direction. Yeah. But I think here, what you know, I very much agree with your sentiment that you know, it is ultimately a concentr you know, concentrations are driving, uh, you know, the the, the the blooms in the lake and. And so we need to, to to move in that direction. I mean, another thing that's been a real challenge that uh, we've heard a little bit about is the the load reduction. Well, the load reduction anyway to improve the nuisance algal bloom in the East Basin. The science doesn't seem to be advanced enough on that front either. So you know, these are really important um, kind of science issues that, through the discussion, right, get illuminated. And, and I would agree that I think it's largely the academic sector that, that, that needs to and is making progress on, uh, on, on this issue. So I don't know if that reaction is helpful, but those Yeah, are no, I, I think I understand that, yeah, what you guys are doing is not, not the frontline science, and so yeah, I was looking more for that kind of perspective. Okay. So I, I just had a comment to the, um, the Ohio in declaring the stress watershed. So we have been in active discussions with Ohio EPA. And so the problem is, is that we, if you want to declare something distressed, what is that number? What puts you on that list? And not only what puts you on that list, what gets you back off that list? Um, and so what's going on right now is actually the EPA has reached out to um, many researchers, and those researchers are at the table right now saying, what are we going to do in 2017 out there sampling the lake and look at those numbers and see what should we be collecting to determine whether it's distressed or not and what are the thresholds for that? Because one of those, most people just think, well, if the algae is there, then you got, um, or most people think phosphorus and nutrients, so we should go out and collect the phosphorus and nutrients. But what we're saying is really what we care about is if it's distressed is if the toxin is there. So we've really got to think about measuring those things. So the things that are on the table and being discussed are measuring chlorophyll, measuring toxin levels, and uh, yeah, satellite Im image on cells per milliliter of water. So those conversations are going on because the federal EPA is saying, you know, you need to come up with criteria. So it's not the fact that they're 
sticking their heads in the sand and saying, no, we're trying to get methodology in place right now to figure out, are we measuring the right things, where do we measure them, and how do we go? So that conversation is on, it's ongoing right now. Question. Great, thanks, Phil. Well, and then one thing, you know, you, I love you IJC folks, uh, <laughs> because you, you always uh, keep pointing to the scientists and saying, you know, it's not our data, we synthesize it. But I would argue in many instances what you guys do is equally as hard as collecting the science, because all of these boards are a collection of volunteers and to kind of herd those cats and make sure people are staying on task and giving the right information. You know, the board that I sit on specifically, we would not be successful if we didn't have the guidance of the leadership within the IJC. And so, to, you know, you need to you know, try and pat yourself on the back. For all the work you guys do, it's unbelievable what happens out of those International Joint Commission meetings. And so thanks for everything that you do, Jim. Great. Thank you. Everybody thank uh,